Good morning, Lifestone Church. Oh, man, with an answer like that, I'm going to have fun this morning. So here's the question. Is loyalty given and earned? So given or earned. So with respect, respect is something that is earned. You can gain respect. You can lose respect. But honor is something very different. Honor is given, right? So we honor our mothers and fathers. We honor kings and, or queens, you know. Honor is something that we give to somebody based on the position that they have in our life. So what about loyalty? Is loyalty something that is given, kind of like honor? Is it something that's earned? kind of like respect. That's what we're going to talk about this morning. And I'm going to do it through looking through four lenses, four different marriages. Um, And and first, I want to talk about this marriage. Uh, It goes back a long time ago. If you were around in the 70s, raise your hand, raise your hand. So we're back. Yes, amen. So we're back in the 70s. Uh, It's a story about a man named Jack and a girl named Cindy. And they were sitting on the front porch of Cindy's house. They're 15 years old. And Jack's been coming around, hanging out with Cindy, you know, here and there. And he's really taken a liking to her. He's got those butterflies in his stomach, you know, that you get when you really, really like somebody. And finally, he works up the courage and works up the boldness. And he looks at Cindy in the eyes and he says, Cindy, I love you. Cindy hears this. And you would think that respond would be mutu- the response would be mutual. But she remembers what her dad said. Don't you ever love a boy? (laughs) And so at the top of her mind and from the bottom of her heart, she looks right at Jack and says, I I don't love you. So this is a story about my mom and my dad. And I was talking to them. I was I was talking to uh, I was talking to my mom about this story, trying to get the facts. And I said, Mom, what did dad? Why did you say that? That's so rude. And she said, I never thought that I would love a boy because my dad told me I wasn't allowed to. Well, this year they'll celebrate 48 years of marriage. Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool? And I asked her, I said, what did dad do? And she said, you know your father. He didn't care. He wasn't shooken up by it. I said, well, what did he do? He said, well, he kept showing up weekend after weekend after weekend. And here I am. And I think that's a story about loyalty. I think that's a story about showing up and showing up. Even though you might not be getting something in return, you continue to be loyal. Um, If you know me, you know I love YouTube and you know I love Google. And so I was searching this question. I typed in, is loyalty something that is given and something or something that is earned? And I got to tell you, it's not really a mixed bag. Uh, there's a lot of consensus. And, and the Google says that, that loyalty is something that is earned. I found that very interesting. But this morning, we're not talking about the world's loyalty. We're talking about the Bible's loyalty. There's a difference. See, the world's loyalty, you've heard of loyalty programs. Man, I love loyalty programs. <laughs> I just got this shirt yesterday, and I got $20 off on it, you know, and I'm just like, yes, like I love loyalty, but that's not loyalty. See, that loyalty, loyalty is not if if I give something, you know, loyalty programs are if the person's spending money with me, then I'll give more back to them. It's it's not loyalty. It's kind of like a a trick, you know, or um, what about loyalty uh, in, in the workplace, loyalty? When my grandfather went to work, you know, you go and you work at a place and you work there for the rest of your life. Let me share this uh, picture on the screen. This is my man, Walter. Walter just celebrated his 100th birthday, which is a milestone in itself. But he's holding uh, this record, this Guinness Book of World Records, for being at the same workplace for 84 years. Isn't that so cool? Some of you are like, I am not working at my job for 84 years. And I'm not saying, I'm not bringing this up because you should stay with your job. I'm just saying, you know, now we have job hopping. The average person stays at a job for about four years is is what I found. And and we don't have job loyalty anymore. It's called career loyalty, that you would be loyal to yourself and to your own career. See, what the world says about loyalty and what the Bible says about loyalty is very different. And that's what I want to take a look at this morning. There's this word that we see in the Bible, and we see it in the book of, of Ruth. It's this word hesed. It's actually, there's a K in front of it, but I took it off because it's going to be hard for me to say. But since we're all in a good mood, I'm going to do it. Right? Hesed. That was good. That was good. Well, this, this word is used 250 times in the Bible. It can be translated as love and faithfulness, unfailing love, faithful love, steadfast love. But my favorite is this idea of loyal love, hesed love. And that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. 
we've been in this um, series talking about Ruth and Boaz. And did I tell you we're going to talk about some marriages today? Was that when my mic was breaking up? We're going to talk about four marriages, Jack and Cindy. And then this next one is Ruth and Boaz. And if you've been coming over the past two weeks, you've already heard this amazing story about Ruth and her amazing story. If you haven't heard it, let me just recap you. So here is Ruth, and she's living in Moab, and she's living there with her mother-in-law and her husband, and the whole family is there all together. But in a short matter of time, her mother-in-law loses her husband and all of her sons. Naomi. She loses her, her husband and all of her sons. And I know like we talked about that the past two weeks and we, we've heard the story of Ruth and you can just kind of hear that and move right along. But like think about that, for example, like if that happened right now, like think if you really knew somebody that went through that amount of grief and that's what Naomi's going through. And she tells her daughter-in-law, Ruth, to stay in Moab, but she was going to go back to be in Bethlehem. She's going to go back to her, to her hometown to die. And she pleads with Ruth to stay, but then Ruth says this. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. Now that's loyalty. Now that's this Hesed type of love. That's this steadfast love. And I believe that that's the kind of love that God has for us. And we see this, we see it in the character of Ruth this morning. Over the past two weeks, as we've been talking about Ruth and knowing that I was going to be preaching about loyalty, I've been trying to make some observations about godly loyalty, about Hesed. And these were the observations that I made. Number one is that loyalty is unconditional. Think about that. Naomi had nothing to offer Ruth. You know, if you've ever lost a loved one, it's a terrible, terrible time. I've heard that the, the biggest pain in life is losing a son or a daughter. And here's Naomi losing all of her sons and losing her husband. I mean, and this is before medication. This is before counseling. The grief placed on this woman's life. You can imagine that type of grief. And when you have that type of grief, you have nothing to give. Nothing to offer. And Ruth knew this. But loyalty is unconditional. Bethlehem had nothing to offer Ruth. Ruth knew nothing of it. She didn't know what she was going to do when she got there. She didn't have a, a plan to, to take care of herself. She just went to be with her mo mother-in-law. Everything looked better in paper in Moab, yet she went because of her Hesed love, because of her loyalty. Number two, loyalty is sacrificial. You might be asking, well, what did Ruth sacrifice to go be with her mother-in-law? You know, I was reading the book of Ruth, and it, it talks about how Ruth ends up in the field of Boaz, and Naomi was like, I'm glad you ended up in his field, because if you would have ended up in anybody else's field, it could have been very bad for you. Because, see, people in Bethlehem didn't like the Moabites, and Ruth was a Moabite. So what did she sacrifice? She sacrificed her life. She sacrificed her future. She sacrificed her well-being. She sacrificed her comfort. She's a brand new person in a brand new land. So loyalty is unconditional. Loyalty is sacrificial. And loyalty is God-facing. This is an important one, especially for you believers out there. Because I believe that God calls us to be in loyal relationships. I believe that God calls men and women to be in loyal relationships marriages. I believe he calls men and women to be in loyal friendships, those Hesed type of friendships. And you cannot do it without being God facing. Because see, people in the world, I mean, I don't know if you know this, but there's a whole bunch of imperfect people in this room right now. You know, and I, I happen to be one of them. Maybe, maybe the most imperfect. Ask my daughters, I'll tell you. But we're imperfect. I was reading this um, book about marriage, and, it, and it, the count, it's a counselor that wrote the book, and he said, I'm always surprised when I get into counseling session with couples. They're always surprised that the other person hurt them. He said, we live in a world of sin. Like, of course, of course somebody, somebody's going to do something against you. And so the only way that you can possibly be loyal to other people is to be God-facing. Because when people are going to break you, God is not going to break you. See, you must keep your eyes on God because God is faithful. 
No matter what the circumstances, God continues to be faithful. God continues to be a good father. God continues to have a purpose and a plan for you. And I have to think that, that Ruth knew that when she went to Bethlehem. She knew it wasn't good for her, but she knew about a good God. She, she knew that she didn't have a plan, but she knew that her God had a plan. And I think those are the type of relationships that God is calling us into. And rumor spread about Ruth. Now, this is cool. I mean, I would love if I had such good character that, that people would know me by my, my good character. And, and they knew Ruth by her good character, Boaz, this guy who, who ha- had this field and, and Ruth is working in his field. He's like, who's that girl over there? And, and everybody talks about Ruth and they talk about her, her character. And so she goes, and we've talked about the story over the past two weeks. She goes and she sleeps at, the, at Boaz's feet because we find out that, that he's a family redeemer and that the whole family can be redeemed if she just sleeps at his feet and that she's hoping to be married to him. And he wakes up a little startled to see this woman sleeping at his feet, and she's startled as well. But this is what Boaz says about her character. The Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness, and the word kindness here is, is hesed. It's this loyal love. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after younger men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. All the people of my town know that you are a woman of noble character. Isn't that cool? He, he notices her hesed type of love. And we've talked about it over the past two weeks, and we'll talk about it even next week. But there's this redemption that takes place. But we've been talking from a 5,000-foot view about the story of Ruth. This morning, I just want to talk about her character. I want to talk about her loyalty. Loyalty, I believe, is a character trait. You know, we speculated last week, why why did Ruth go with Naomi? Why did she go to Bethlehem? When everything did not make sense, she still went. Well, you can speculate for days, and we don't know. But one thing we do know is that loyal people do loyal things. And that's why she went, because she was loyal. Now, I said we were going to talk about four marriages. Anybody keeping track of how many marriages so far? Two marriages, right? Jack and Cindy, Ruth and Boaz. And this next marriage between Hosea and Gomer. Now, I found this story to be extremely interesting. I've never really studied it until I studied it this week, but something really cool happens in the book of Hosea. God tells Hosea the woman he should marry. I mean, we got any bachelors out there? Any bachelor men? Ladies, look around. Look around. We got some bachelor men out there. I would have loved it when I was a bachelor if God showed up and told me the woman I should marry. I mean, that would have been fantastic, right? Like he just lays it out, and this is the woman you should marry, and then I could go marry that woman. Well, you might not be saying that once you hear the type of woman that God tells Hosea to marry. In Hosea chapter 1, it says, When the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go, marry a promiscuous woman and have children with her. For like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. Plot twist. I mean, can you imagine, like, the weight of hearing that? Like, that would be a a very terrifying thing to hear. And why did God tell Hosea to do this? This is the bigger message. This is the bigger point. Why did God tell Hosea to marry that woman? So that Israel would understand how I see them. I see them as adulterous women. I see them as an unfaithful wife. And so I want you to marry an unfaithful wife so that the world will know that they've been unfaithful to me. They had kids, and man, they picked some bad baby names. (laughs) The The one name, the one child was named after a massacre. The next child was named, her, uh, her name meant not loved. And the last child, Lo Ami, her, her name meant not my people. See, God was, was showing him, he was showing Hosea that this is how I view my people. They're no longer my people, and they're no longer loved. And it just made me think, like, you know, when, when Hosea and Gomer, when they got married, did Hosea really love her? Could he? And I have to think yes. I have to think he did. 
Because loyal love, Hesed love, is unconditional. It's sacrificial, and it's God-facing. I also believe Hesed love is an action. It's, it's a feeling, but it's also an action. And here, this amazing thing happens in Hosea chapter 3. At just the right time, Hosea is told by God to go. The Lord said to me, Go show your love to your wife again, though she is loved by another man and is an, adul- is, and is an adulteress. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods and love the sacred raisin cakes. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and about a homer of lethic of barley. Then I told her, you are to live with me many days. You must not be a prostitute or be intimate with any man, and I will behave the same way towards you. He goes and he buys his bride back with every thing that he had. Scholars say that this must have been all of his wealth, 15 shekels of silver in his lunch. He went there and showed up with everything that he had to buy his bride back. And if you're like me, you're wondering, why would somebody have to buy their bride back, you know? Well, it's because she had entered into this life of slavery. She had sold herself into slavery. She was in this adulterous relationship. She completely turned her back on her husband. But don't you remember, like, the whole reason that God said Hosea to do this is because that is what he is doing for his people. That God is going to rescue back the Israelites. He's going, and he's going to pay a price for them. And we see that here in Hosea chapter 2. We get to hear, you know, at one point God said that he's calling Israel not my people. At one point he's, he's calling them, that he's saying that he does not love them. But here in Hosea 2, we hear this story of God rescuing his bride. Therefore, I am now going to allure her. I will lead her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. And that day declares the Lord, you will call me my husband. And you will no longer call me my master. And that day I will make a new covenant for them. Ah, oh, in that day. Man, don't you just long for that day. That day is today. God's promise for us is today. He has rescued us. He has made a way. He has paid the ultimate price. But see, all of these marriages are pouring to the greatest marriage of all. I've only talked about three. Remember, I was going to talk about four marriages. And we see here in the story of Hosea that this isn't just a, a story about, his, about this husband buying his wife out of slavery. No, it's about God buying us out of the slavery to sin. It's about God purchasing us, uh, purchasing us back. And Ruth isn't just a story about this man redeeming the family. It's not just a story about Ruth being in the right place at the right time. It's a story about you this morning being in the right place at the right time, with a father, with a husband that has the right place. And Jack and Cindy, it's not just a story about how Jack was pursuing Cindy. It's a story about how husbands should treat their wives. But it's not just a story about how husbands should treat their wives. It's a story about how Christ treats his bride. This is the fourth marriage. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. To make her holy, watch this description. To make her holy, cleansing her with the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church. Sounds like a wedding day. Without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In Ephesians, Paul goes on and on and on about how marriages should be, but then in Ephesians 5.32, he says, This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. See, the greatest marriage of all, the best wedding you will ever go to is this godly wedding. This wedding where where Jesus Christ rescues his church. And we read about it in the book of Revelations. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, listen to this description, fine linen, bright and clean, was given to her to wear. Church, that's you and that's me this morning.
But God told Hosea to do that so we would understand what it was like. Uh, I oftentimes, you know, think and reflect back on my life about how about how I turned my back on God. You know, if you, you know, an adulterous marriage that that's what it is. It's, you know, the the wife or the husband, they turn their back on their spouse. But if I'm just being honest with you this morning, it, it's it's more than that. Because when I turned my back on God, I turned my back on God and I liked it. I wanted it. I wanted to be in control. I wanted this world. I, I wanted money. I, I wanted fame. I, I, I wanted all the things that this world had to offer. How's that worked for you, church? It didn't work really well for me. You know, in Hosea, God says that Israel doesn't know me, that the reason why they're going through all this stuff and all this judgment is because they didn't know me. But this world, this word know, it says they did not have knowledge of God. The band band can come on up. They did not have knowledge of God, but this word knowledge, it doesn't mean just like knowing, like knowing in our mind. You know, for example, like I'm married. And my wife, we've been together for a long time, and I know her. I know her inside and out. You might know her, too. She's Danielle. She checked your kids in this morning. You might even know where she went to school. You, you might even know a little bit about her childhood. You know, you might know, you know what, what she likes and what she dislikes. She's an amazing cook. You might know that about her. But you will never know her like I know her because I know my bride relationally. And that's how God wants to know you. See, uh, there's people in this room that they know God. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know God. Yeah, the creator of the universe. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know Jesus. He died on the cross for my sins. But do you know him? Mm. Do, you, do you know him like a husband knows a bride or like a bride knows her husband? See, what I love about these two stories coming together, the book of Hosea and the book of Ruth coming together, is that we see that We see Ruth is in the right place at the right time. We've talked about this over the past two weeks. It's God's providence. But she's in the right place at the right time. And then we see Hosea paying the right price for his bride. So we see in the one story that this person's in the right place at the right time. And we see in another story there's the right price for the bride. At the right time, the husband paid the right price. And I believe that's the gospel. I believe that's the greater story being told. And you might be thinking, there is no way that somebody could love me. There's no way that God could love me with that kind of love. I'm adulterous. I've left him. I've been unfaithful. I've been unloyal. But God's love is unconditional. God's love is sacrificial. God's love is His will. He's not choosing to rescue you for anything that you've done. He's choosing to rescue you because He is a rescuer. He's choosing to love you because He's a love you because He's a lover. He's tru- choosing to be loyal to you because God is loyal. God is Hesed. In 1 Corinthians, we see that you were not your own. You were bought at a price. But not 15 shekels of silver and a pack of lunch. You were bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. What a payment. What a payment. And then in Romans, it says, you see at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. I love that. While we were powerless, so many of us are guilty of trying to get our lives right. I'm going to get my life right, and then I'm going to go to Lifestone Church, you know. There's no getting your life right. Just like for, for an adulterous woman, there, there's no getting her, her life right. The act of sin has already been committed. It's not about what she can do. It's about what the groom has done. Amen? Why we were still powerless... And I just think about what that would have been like for Gomer. You know, 
in some other man's house day after day after day of committing this sin thinking back on what it used to be like thinking back what her husband used to be like but now she she's in love with this man that she doesn't even know I think about the sin that she was wrapped up in I think about the darkness of that room her hiding in her sin but then at just the right time the husband came to, to pay just the right price can you imagine that knock on the door? Oh. I'm here for my bride. That's exactly what God is doing right now in this room at just the right time with just the right price. He's knocking on the door and he's saying, I'm here for my bride. I'm here for you. He is here for you. He is here for me. He is here for all of us. Jesus did not pay for our sins only in part. He paid for all of our sins. So if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. That is our story. That is the greatest marriage story ever told. So I forgot to answer the question. Is loyalty given or is loyalty earned? It's given. God is loyal because God is loyal. God is loving because God is loving. And he loves you. And there's nothing you can do about it. He loves you deeply. But here's the real question. Loyalty is given, but are you open to receiving it? That's the real question. See, because Ruth chose to be with Boaz. See, because Gomer chose to be with Hosea. See, because Cindy chose to be with Jack. But you, God's bride, what do you choose? So with every eye closed, I just want to pray for you this morning. Maybe you came here this morning and you don't have that relationship with God. As we learned this morning that Knowing God is more than just knowing about Him. It's knowing Him through relationship. Maybe you've never entered into a relationship with God. It starts just like, like any relationship. You make a commitment to each other. I will be with you and you will be with me. It's the same thing with God. God has came and He's paid the price for you. When you were in your sin, there was nothing you could do to be in relationship with Him. But God wants you to rescue out of that slavery to sin. If you've never chosen to be in a relationship with Jesus Christ, could you just show me your hand this morning? With all eyes closed, He wants to see you. He wants to know, He wants to rescue you back to Him. Amen. God, I just pray over them this morning, God. I pray over those that raised their hand. God, I pray that they would continue to chase after you. God, I thank you for knocking on the door to their heart this morning. God, I thank you for rescuing them. God, we pray for the forgiveness of our sins. God, we repent from our sins. We run away from them. We run away from that life, God. We're out of it, God. And we realize we can't get out of it without you purchasing, it, purchasing us back into you. And so, God, we thank you for that, for paying the ultimate price, God, for your blood shed on the cross. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, church, just one more thing. For those of you that have been walking with the Lord for a long time, I just, I just want to bless you this morning. You know, oftentimes when somebody gives a, a message like this, you can be like, oh, I'm so glad that he's talking to other people. But I believe the Holy Spirit is talking to all of us this morning. When you understand that God has hesed love for you, when you understand that he is loyal to you, there is nothing keeping from you going out and changing this world, for flipping this world upside down for God. John talked about it during worship. He said, some of you just need to unlock everything that God has to offer you. And when you know that you have a husband that is for you, that he will pay all prices for you, when you know that he loves you unconditionally, sacrificially, and in his will, you can let loose. There is no safer place to be in the world than in the will of God the Father. 
And so I just want to pray that blessing over you this morning. God, I pray for these saints. God, I pray for these believers. God, I pray that you would unlock their faith this morning. God, I pray that they would see you for the loving husband that you are. God, I pray that wherever they go, they know that you go, that you are right there with them. So God, build our faith this morning. Build our boldness this morning. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.